Good afternoon and welcome to United TV. My name is Kamal Arkun. Today is July 19th, 2024. Uh, today we have another special session uh, focused on exploring different types of bariatric surgery. Whether you are considering bariatric surgery for yourself or for your loved ones, uh, this is the uh, episode for you to learn uh, more about different bariatric surgery types. Uh, as usual, we have Dr. Isaac here now with us. Uh, he's one of the most experienced surgeons, bariatric surgeon, not only in Delaware, probably in the United States. Uh, Dr. Erdogan is uh, giving his clinical insight and making sure that what we have today, what we are discussing today, is uh, all coming from the clinical uh, base. And I will be helping him with some of our questions and uh, we'll make sure that. Uh, you have a good understanding of what type of surgery you should be getting if you are considering bariatric surgery. Dr. Young, we can do a camera. Okay. Now, today is, uh, is a special day for us because the first time we do this together in the same room. Uh, so uh, it is uh, a little bit different, right? It's great. Um, it's great. I'm used to having him uh, on the other uh, side of the town. So, but today he's in our uh, studio in our new uh, office. So we are uh, kind of lucky to have a very nice uh, studio here. So, how are you doing? I am doing fantastic, Kamal. This is just a great setting. I'm very happy to be here for yet another bariatric project. So, Dr. Gad, this is our new cycle as well. Um, so we have uh, done so many. Uh, full cycles, and this is the first episode. Um, it's not easy to cover these uh, from different perspectives, but somehow we are able to manage that. But what I did for our uh, patient, we put these uh, same topics in uh, one playlist, so uh, they can actually watch maybe five, six different bariatric uh, surgery types uh, videos. Uh, just going to the playlist and then just uh, do that and. Uh, they don't have to necessarily uh, just watch one or two. They can do the whole thing. So, um, but uh, just to have a background on uh, different surgery types, you have been doing this for almost 24 years now. Yep. Uh, what are the different types of uh, bariatric surgeries and the American bones and specifics? Of course. So, bariatric surgery, of course, as we've said many times, is a the most effective treatment we currently have for severe or moderate morbid obesity. When obesity has gone to the extent where there is uh, really a risk of the development of several illnesses related to obesity that could be life-threatening, whether it's diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, or the really development of different cancers, which happen to really uh, find a fertile ground in obesity. So uh, when obesity gets to those levels, and typically we're talking about somebody who's 80, 90, 100 pounds or more above their ideal body weight, uh, not only there is this risk of these illnesses, but it is extremely difficult to get rid of the weight uh, without an effective treatment like a bariatric surgery. Bariatric surgery now is a very well established, safe uh, treatment that is really advocated by uh, doctors in the United States when they are uh, when their patients uh, present with uh, extreme levels of obesity. So um, I'm running a video uh, for people to kind of see different images. Obviously, we may not be on that specific type while we are talking about it, but that's going to run uh, in a loop. Um, we want to probably start with uh, bypass first. Sure. Um, uh, what's the bariatric uh, gastric bypass? Uh, what is that uh, procedure? Uh, who should be getting it? Um, what's the best candidate for that? Uh, we can start with that and then we'll go to the Absolutely. So all bariatric procedures as surgery entail 
some kind of change to the upper portion of the digestive tract. And we're talking about the food pipe or the esophagus, the stomach, and the early portion of the intestine. With gastric bypass, what we do essentially is we partition the stomach. We divide the stomach between a very small portion still attached to the food pipe and the rest of the stomach. And we separate these two portions of the stomach completely. And then to restore continuity so that the food that comes from the food pipe into the little stomach can get into the rest of the intestine, actually we reroute the intestine and we attach a portion of the intestine to that little stomach, bypassing the larger stomach and the early intestine. That's why it's known as gastric bypass. Gastric bypass really has been established as the gold standard of bariatric surgery because that's the one that we have developed for many years. In fact, early in our career at about 20, 22 years ago, gastric bypass was the procedure we did the most. Okay? It's a very effective procedure. It has uh, excellent results, and nowadays it can be done laparoscopically. In fact, in our center, uh, very often we do it as a day procedure where patients come in, have gastric bypass, and go home at the same time. Right? Excellent results. And really, Anybody who has morbid obesity could be potentially a candidate for this very well-established procedure. However, gastric bypass really has been pushed aside a little bit by the arrival of another very powerful procedure, but less invasive procedure, which is the gastric sleeve. So although the vast majority of patients who have morbid obesity could be candidates for the gastric bypass procedure, we don't necessarily offer the gastric bypass as the first line procedure. We offer them the gastric sleeve. The gastric sleeve is less invasive than the gastric so bypass. Just before we go to yeah. that, with gastric bypass, what we are saying is, you're, uh, you're a young person, let's say, uh, and you don't have diabetes, like severe diabetes, you don't have refluxes. Uh, and also, we do EGD to see if there are uh, issues, uh, structural issues in, this, uh, in the stomach. So, and if there is no clinical need for you to have a bypass, you should not get a bypass as your first option. Totally. Right. I think that's a fair statement, Kamal. I mean, clearly all procedures are uh, appropriate because they're well established, right? But really, if somebody can do the same, can get the same results mm -hmm. with a less intrusive procedure, right? Like the sleeve, there is no need to go with the gastric fibers, right? So there's no really need to do a very long run for a short jump, as they say, right? The gastric sleeve in the vast majority of times can give the same or similar results to the gastric bypass to the vast majority of patients who are looking for bariatric surgery. And therefore we don't necessarily offer the gastric bypass as a first line treatment. Clearly, I wanna state here, Kamal, that the choice of procedure is something that, you know, should be decided between the surgeon and the patient. It's not something we prescribe necessarily, but it is our, uh, job, obviously, to inform patients with our knowledge based on years and years of experience, having operated on thousands of patients over, over the time. So, you know, for somebody who has morbid obesity, as you say, they don't have severe reflux, gastric sleeve will absolutely do as the first line procedure, and it will give the similar results to gastric bypass. Now, it is important to clarify the issue of reflux here, Kamal, because, you know, yes, there is some truth about reflux and the need of gastric bypass, but a lot of what is talked about is actually a myth, right? Somebody who has some reflux would come to our office saying, I can't have the sleeve because they read something about that. Right? Mm -hmm. It is not true. The type of reflux that would negate the gastric sleeve is really severe type of reflux that really affects only a very small minority of patients who have reflux symptoms. And that is something obviously that we diagnose after we do endoscopy, which is one of the preparation procedures that we right. do before bariatric surgery. So it is really fair, as you stated, Kamal, that the vast majority of patients who will do absolutely well with the gastric sleep as the first line of treatment, right? Now, who are the patients on whom a gastric bypass might be placed? Well, these are a minority of patients, for instance, that would have very severe reflux. And some bariatric surgeons also feel that patients who have a very difficult to, uh, 
uh, treat uh, diabetes, right? Diabetes, which is really difficult in its response to medications, those patients might be better with the gastric bypass because gastric bypass definitely has an edge in its impact on the resolution of diabetes when you compare it to gastric sleep. Again, so it's when they are not able to manage it with medication. Like some, I see some patients who have uh, uh, reactions to like metformin, so they are not able to take it. Uh, they try different things and it doesn't work for them, and then they must see so high. So that in those cases, this would be the right way to go. Absolutely. So we're talking again in a you know small minority of patients. Again, it's not all patients with diabetes, but again. You know, patients, when they come to my uh, consultation, very often uh, they are very happy to listen to my advice, my experience based on what I've done, and they will ask questions, but there may be some patients on whom certain ideas may be so set based on experience in the school family members and friends. They may say, you know what, doctor, I just want the bypass. And if that is the case, absolutely. You know, these are procedures that are appropriate for all patients requiring yeah. bariatric surgery. But... As you know, we mentioned earlier, the vast majority of patients would do well with the sleep. Now, it is important, just like I described what the changes were with the gastric bypass, that we describe what the changes are with the gastric sleep as, mm -hmm. as well, right? With the gastric sleep, the main difference is that the intestine is left in its natural place and situation. We don't reroute it. We don't cut it. All the surgery is focused on the stomach itself, that larger organ. And what we do essentially with the stomach is we divide it so that the stomach, which is naturally the shape of a watermelon, mm -hmm. when we're done with the sleeve now, has the shape of a banana. It's much slender, it's much tubular. The larger distending portion of the stomach is the portion that we see. Now, it is definitely true that a lot of the results from the sleeve come from the fact that now the stomach is small. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a lot of volume. Therefore, when the person eats after they've had the sleep, they will feel full early and they are going to be hungry less frequent. But there are other effects of the gastric sleep as well. By removing the portion of the stomach, which is distensible, we're actually removing a metabolically active portion of the stomach that communicates with our brain to promote storage of fat, right? And so many, by removing many, many that- people don't understand that, right? So uh, when we say we are cutting part of the stomach, uh, the stomach, so they're like, so, so what, right? That's not so what. So that's, that part uh, is the part that communicates with the brain. Absolutely, absolutely. It's almost, it has its own personality. Like they kind of, just, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, the gut is known as the second brain because right. it is so much more involved in its communication with the brain, and rightly so, because our digestive tract is so critical in our energy balance. But the way how our body has evolved, essentially, it favors storage of fat, right? Our body is not designed to lose weight. It doesn't know how to lose weight, right? Mm -hmm. It knows how to gain weight, but it doesn't know, right? So all the systems are really optimized for storage storage of energy, which means for increasing weight. Once so, we remove know, I have a picture right yeah. now, Dr. Gal, I don't know if you're able to yeah. see it. I, like, I stopped the video for a second, just for, uh, I, because I want people to really understand this. So this comes up as a question um, uh, from patients and from others, from yeah. providers, from physicians as well. So the part that we are removing is uh, the part that makes us hungry. That's right. Uh, as it happens, the picture we have here is actually the sleeve plus the vaginal switch. Come on, so I don't want people to get confused no. because there is rerouting of the intestine as well. Uh, so if you have one. one where we just have the removal of the, uh, and I think you had it a moment I ago. It, I, it. I mean, this, this as you, you're correct. My, when you look at the stomach, that's essentially how the uh, stomach is divided. But this is showing the sleeve plus the body nuts, which, which is obviously a different procedure. But it's coming. Yeah. But the idea, again, is that a portion of the stomach that we're removing is not just food storage portion of the stomach, but it's also a very active portion of our organ that once it's removed, it deprives the body from its 
mechanisms of fat storage. That's why it's so much easier to lose weight after the sleep is done, for instance, as opposed to a diet that gives you an equal amount of uh, calories, right? You can decrease your calories with a certain diet, but you know that after a while, the weight will stop. It's not the same thing with the sleep because, yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like uh, the picture is not the best one. I'm going to get a better picture for us. Absolutely. So essentially, by removing that distending portion of the stomach, we are making the person uh, metabolically different from what they were before, right? Now they are able to lose weight. The body is much more permissive about it because that's why they are able to do that. So metabolically, we can become much healthier now because not everything is geared towards weight gain. Everything now is much better balanced. That's why people are able to lose weight. So it is important to emphasize here that the results from the gastric sleep are not just purely mechanical, but they are metabolic as well. Now, a uh, couple of weeks ago, we did a gastric balloon um, as one of the methods, not necessarily for morbid obesity, but I think maybe on the lower side of morbid obesity, but more on the higher side of obesity that we choose uh, to go with. Uh, I mean, you, we can briefly mention that since we just did that session, we don't need to go into the details. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it's the least invasive procedure we have. You're, you're absolutely right. We don't, uh, it's indicated for class one and class two obesity and not necessarily for morbid obesity. And it's a procedure that is transient. It's completely reversible and it's not surgical. In other words, there is no incisions that we make. The balloon is inserted endoscopically, but then after six months, it has to be removed. So the indications for the balloon are limited from that point of view, but there is clearly a section of uh, the obesity suffering people who would benefit from the balloon of and of course as our practice as being an all-rounded bariatric practice does offer the balloon as well sure now um we should mention the um, gastric band uh, just so that it would be my transition to the revision surgeries uh, we don't do the band anymore as much as we used to uh, that used to be the number one procedure 15 years ago uh, but today, that's not really happening. Uh, anything you would like to actually cover for Ben? So when the gastric band was first uh, launched, Kamal, it became very popular. It became popular because it was a procedure that was seen as an alternative to gastric bypass because these were really the only procedures really available at that time. Gastric bypass, very extensive changes. And then came the band, which is a device that you put around uh, the stomach no cutting, right? And also it's a device that could be removed. So there was this sense that it was a potentially reversible procedure and it's still a valid procedure. But the device itself with its presence in that upper portion of the stomach in the long term does create problems, particularly in the quality of life, right? It's not predictable when the person will be able to swallow their food without any difficulty as opposed to being sick. That really interferes with the quality of life. Secondly, the weight loss itself, there is clearly a difference between the band, the sleeve, and the, and the gastric bypass in terms of weight loss. It's not as powerful a procedure as, it, as the sleeve or the gastric bypass when it comes to weight loss. And then there is the added issue of having to do adjustments of the band. You know, patients have to come to the office from time to time to have their band tightened or loosened, right? And because of that, we actually are, have seen way more band removals in recent years as opposed to band placements. And I think the availability of the sleeve as an option to bypass actually has pushed out the band as an other alternative to gastric bypass. So we, we are seeing a lot more of that. But we still see patients who have had the band for many years and who are doing very well. We still see patients who struggle with the band and have their band removed, and then we move on to a different procedure. And our practice still manages band patients that require adjustment, whether it's removal of the fluid or additional fluid. But as you correctly said, it as a primary procedure, we don't perform it as nearly, nowhere near as frequently as we used to in the past. Sure. Now, um, the other uh, part of the, uh, I guess, the surgery times, we up to now, we are talking about bariatric surgery times, but when it comes to 
revision, uh, although they are also bariatric surgeries, but we put them under revision surgeries. So starting from band, uh, there are several different ways to have a revision. And one of whom would be um, having uh, going from band to sleeve or band to bypass. So can you explain the process, how it works for those who are planning to, let's say if someone had a uh, gastric band 15 years ago, now they're looking for other options and then sleeve is where they want to go, what process they would have to go through? So they would have to go through a similar process than, you know, as a person who's starting bariatric surgery, because they really need to be educated about the differences in terms of lifestyle afterwards, right? So, and also go back to the basics there again, you know, we have to have a multidisciplinary evaluation, which would include the um, nutritionists, very often the psychologists, but also making the, sure that the person is uh, healthy enough to undergo the procedure. So their hearts, their lungs, and everything has to be prepared optimally. Now, it is important to understand that the band itself creates a lot of scar tissue around the stomach. And that scar tissue by itself can be a potential for increasing risks of complications. So what our choice is in our practice, Kamal, is to have the band removed first, and let the person heal and the scar tissue mellow a little bit for two to three months before we take them back to do the uh, revision surgery, for instance, to the sleeve. Now, uh, it is important to sit down and discuss with patients that revision surgery does increase the risk for complications from you know, initial surgery, just because there was no scar tissue when we first did the procedure, essentially. And scar tissue does not heal as well as virgin tissue, tissue that hasn't been operated on. So it's important for them to understand that. But in also revision surgery, star revision surgery that is undertaken by experienced surgeons because of that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, surgery requires knowledge of anatomy, Kamal. And then when there has been previous surgery, that anatomy gets uh, disrupted and the surgeon has to be experienced enough to understand this disrupted anatomy and you know perform the procedure uh, which means that it needs to be performed in very experienced centers and our, our practice having been doing this for many years does have the experience to do revision surgery and we do of course a lot of revision surgeries as well so bands remove them wait the, for the healing process to occur the person will go through the multidisciplinary preparation and then we can undertake a sleep gastrectomy uh, after that. And for those who may be kind of questioning or asking this question, like why someone had a band, now they have to go through another surgery. That's the same thing that we mentioned earlier. If uh, that was not about that time, that was the uh, best option. Maybe it was the uh, only few options because sleep wasn't there until 2010, right, Dr. Rigal? Absolutely, uh, yes. Yep. Uh, so when there are better techniques and better methods, of course, we are going to improve. Uh, so a lot of people, they have a lot of, uh, they, they benefited from having a gastric band, but those uh, who didn't have other options. So this is why we are saying that you don't have to go with the, uh, uh, like most maybe, uh, not necessarily complicated, but per could be most complicated uh, in terms of like bypass. If you are, you're a younger person and uh, you don't have other comorbidities, this would be the time where you can actually look into going from band to uh, gastric sleeve, which we are talking about like three, four month uh, period, which doesn't really add as much, right? Dr. Gav, because our patients, by the time we prep them, that takes about uh, anywhere from nine to 12 weeks. Um, because of all the clearances and everything that they need to get. Um, now, there are those who would go from band to uh, bypass. Mm -hmm. Are the same rules applying uh, in terms of the conditions and criteria that we are choosing for those? Yes. And uh, it is important to mention in this case, Kamal, that uh, there may be more of a case to go from band to bypass than to go to bypass initially. And the reason for that is, with the presence of the band, many people may have developed irritation of the food pipe that you want to protect from acid in the future. So it is not uncommon to go to bypass as a first choice 
you know, after the removal of the band, particularly after you've investigated with endoscopy and assessed the food pipe and so forth. There is a school of thought among some bariatric surgeons which says that if somebody hasn't done very well with the band, they should go automatically to bypass just because they are thinking, well, the band is more or less a restrictive procedure. So going from one restrictive to another restrictive procedure like the sleep does not make any sense if the person hasn't succeeded totally. I'm not sure we should uh, adapt this dogma necessarily because everybody is different. So it is important to really have a in-depth conversation with the patient as to why they have struggled, as to why that revision is necessary, and obviously for them to understand the implications of going to uh, sleeve or to bypass. That's a very individual conversation that we have to have with the patients, but obviously both options are there. Uh, again, many patients would rather go to sleep first as opposed to bypass because of the implications, long-term implications of bypass. But it is our job, obviously, to educate them on to whether that is really appropriate in their particular individual situation. And even though it's a small, uh, very small percentage, but there are some people, they would have uh, bend over bypass, right? Not bend over sleep, but bend over bypass. That's correct. That's correct. So That's very little. It's, I have seen it uh, in case there are anyone questioning. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, not all the surgeons at CREAS offer this option, Kamal, but uh, it is offered, which means that for some patients who've had gastric bypass many years ago and are struggling with weight regain, uh, then tightening that portion, that connection between the intestine and the, and the stomach with a band around it is an option. There are many issues that need to be discussed there because having a foreign object around that connection is not uh, something that can be taken lightly, right? So uh, again, uh, when you discuss options for revision, particularly after gastric bypass, there are not very many surgical options, right? But band over bypass is a potential. Again, not all the career surgeons offer it, but it is something that in some circumstances could be appropriate and uh, perhaps even work well. Sure. Um, in terms of other revision surgeries, um, we do so the one sort of procedure we haven't obviously mentioned is the duodenal switch, Kamal. The duodenal switch is the procedure that is not done as commonly, but it is a procedure which is in a way similar to gastric bypass, right? There is clearly a removal of a portion of the stomach, just like the sleeve, but then the stomach is reconnected to a much lower portion of the uh, intestine. And at the end of the procedure, the portion of the intestine that will be processing, digesting, and absorbing nutrients is much, much shorter than the gastric bypass. And the duodenal switch is the procedure that really offers uh, the best in terms of total weight loss in the long term. It is very powerful uh, in, with diabetes, but also it is the one procedure that will have the most implications long term in terms of vitamin deficiency, perhaps change in bowel activity like diarrhea. So it is offered in our practice. It's not uh, you know, as commonly done as the sleep or the gastric bypass, but it's an option that we offer, particularly with patients who've had the sleep already and they are struggling to lose all the weight that they wanted, uh, this, this, which is uh, one option that we offer as well. So uh, now for those uh, who may be in the middle of uh, making this decision, uh, the, one of the things that we do is an uh, EGD and endoscopy, upper endoscopy. And uh, if some someone decided to go with gastric sleeve, but then we find out that they have Barrett, uh, there are a couple of ways that we kind of uh, go by. Either patient doesn't have any problems with going with bypass, or if they have any uh, doubt, or if there are any clinical other conditions that we may actually repeat the EGD second time to validate the first one. Uh, in some cases, I know that patients do come back with questions like why they have to go through this. So when you say Barrett, uh, I know uh, what it is in terms of what we need to do and what we don't need to do. But for those who don't know what it is, uh, if you can just uh, explain that so that uh, 
those patients can benefit from. Yeah, so absolutely. So Barrett's disease um, uh, describes essentially a condition in the lower end of the food pipe, that end of the food pipe that immediately connects with the stomach. And in that, that is a condition that develops after there has been irritation of the food pipe over a long period of time with acid. Now, the potential risk of Barrett's disease is that that tissue, that lining could sometimes in a small uh, fraction of people mm -hmm. that can change itself into cancer, right? So cancer of the food pipe could potentially develop in some fraction of people who have Barrett's disease. Now, if that is the case, it is important to minimize ongoing irritation of that area with acid. Well, mm -hmm. you cannot avoid that with the sleeve because the sleeve has the stomach still connected to the food pipe and acid will continue to bath that area. So theoretically, we want to avoid that. So if we discover Barrett's, we say, look, probably the better option for us in terms of achieving weight loss would be to go to gastric bypass, although gastric bypass has its own drawbacks, because in this particular situation, we want to minimize the risk of potential uh, evolution of Barrett's disease in something more sinister like cancer, essentially. Now, now, all these are theoretical considerations, of course, and there, there are maybe other considerations also to, to say that, you know, if a person were to develop, you know, cancer of the lower end of the uh, food pipe, then having an intact stomach is important for the future surgery and so forth. These are all theoretical considerations, but still valid. But at the end of the day, come on, you know, it is very important to understand that the most critical discussion is the one that occurs between the surgeon and the patient at the time of consultation. And why is that? And it is because everyone is different. Everyone mm -hmm. is different in terms of their actual medical condition. So yes, patients will be likely to have Googled and uh, come up with some uh, conclusions about uh, what may something mean or not, but. Google does not write about that individual patient, right? Google writes generalized information, which often may not be accurate as well, right? Or may not be applicable to a particular situation. So that is why you and I have this informative discussions on our Bariatric Friday, but ultimately our patients are going to decide on their treatment course after they come to our practice for a consultation where we have extensive discussions after review of their medical condition. And that discussion is actually ongoing. As you know, our patients have to go through a fairly extensive process of evaluation with nutritionists, with psychologists and other specialists. And they will be meeting up with their surgeon on a number of occasions through that process. And those occasions will be important for them to continue that discussion so that they feel comfortable with the choice they make about what is ultimately better for them. Well, we don't, we don't Google anymore, Doctor. We do chat GPT. <laughs> so, a little bit more advanced now, but more sophisticated, but still not as uh, good as the uh, initial consult that they would have with a surgeon. Um, now, I, I bet uh, if I say chat GPT instead of Google, many people may not know yet, may not know that yet. Come on. Well, they probably do, so. Google has pervaded our, our language, language <laughs> so much now <laughs> to, to replace research. Now we are created. So um, now uh, dealing with patients, uh, communicating with patients on a daily basis, um, I know that not everyone is able to make this decision on their own, but then there are a bit too much out there uh, where it kind of um, uh, probably influences the patients in a wrong way in terms of what they, what's right and what's wrong uh, with them. Do you find patients coming to the office uh, for the first consult, like kind of like opinionated? So they already, already know that this is what they are gonna do in terms, even if you told them, no, this is not the right thing for you. Or is it naturally, like that? Naturally, naturally. So because, first of all, this is a decision that evolves over time, right? They think about it maybe even as long as two, three years prior to actually taking action and coming to the office. So through that time, they will have had experience and interactions with people who may have had the surgery before, and they may have seen 
uh, uh, results that may have been appealing to them or not. So they will form an opinion as to what they want. And as I said, in the vast majority of cases, actually, we are able to accommodate what patients are comfortable with, right? But it is important, of course, for us to go with them through their individual history and then counsel them at what might be best. I can tell you, and you probably have the numbers as well, the vast majority of patients are undergoing sleeve gastrectomy. And this is not just particular in our practice, it's actually nationwide. You can see that the levels of sleeve gastrectomy are much, much higher, right? It's, a, it's about 75% uh, uh, overall and a little bit more for us uh, with the surgery center. So, yeah. Uh, so this is going to say, yeah. Less so complicated, the, and if they don't have those comorbidities, it's kind of the right way to go. Um, uh, but I was just thinking because, you know, uh, I used to have maybe less interactions with the patients in the last, like, uh, but in the last three, four years, I do have more. Uh, because now with the case conferences and having those on a daily basis, so I end up just calling the patient. In right. some cases, I have like seven, eight other people, but I do pick and choose who to call based on the difficulties uh, they may have. And, uh, you know, uh, patients are pretty opinionated when it comes to what they want. Uh, so I was just kind of wondering how open they are uh, to take uh, the recommendation directly if they want to make their decision and they don't want to go back. Um, and, and, and after the, you know, after the discussion, we're okay to follow what the patient is comfortable with, as long as there are no major contraindications to do that. As I say, I, I presented the issue of the uh, Barrett's, for instance, which is an important one, but there may, uh, may be other considerations as well, which may make a patient really go with one procedure versus the other. So we've talked about the sleep where we are removing just the stomach and then that is really the procedure and then gastric bypass where not only we cut the stomach, but we reroute the intestine as well. But both procedures are done laparoscopically, which means we make very small incisions. And in our program, in, in the vast majority of cases, this is an outpatient procedure, which means patients go home the same day and recover fairly uh, quickly from these procedures as well. Of course, they are surgical procedures. Go ahead. I was just gonna actually, you kind of stole my line on that because I was just gonna talk about how actually uh, straightforward to take care of these patients after the surgery. And we send them home 99.9% .9 of the time uh, after the operation, it's about six hours average that they, uh, they stay in the surgery center, yet how much they have to go through uh, mm -hmm. to get the surgery done. Yeah. And then also that fear, uh, like if you were to just ask any random person uh, their opinion of how risky bariatric surgery versus a uh, gallbladder, they're gonna say, well, bariatric probably is like 10 times more riskier. In fact, uh, that's not the case. Right. Uh, maybe they're even uh, they, uh, they're maybe same or maybe bariatric surgery, I would say less because in many cases, uh, most cases, it's not happening because of the emergency. So um, we prep the patient for three to six months. Uh, we get all the clearances. So, uh, but yet uh, patient is discharged the same day. So yes. many well, and it's, it's kind of new uh, because, uh, you know, the other day I was uh, looking at one of the market, marketing materials from one of the hospitals, um, the way they are emphasizing like the hospital side of it, but we don't want our patients to go to the hospital. This is not a hospital procedure if it can be done uh, with the, uh, the team that specialized in bariatrics. Uh, this is like, this is our boutique um, like no one does this better than we do in anywhere else, like hospital or not hospital. So, uh, and if it can be done in the outpatient setting, and if you can go home on the same day, it tells you one, uh, it's not too complicated or it's the perception of the complication is not uh, uh, right. And the other thing is, well, you'll go home. So there's no hospital uh, fear of staying in the hospital or getting um staff infection at the hospital and you know, all those issues that you have uh, complications of this is the best uh, place to do it. And 
same day home. So that's, I think that says a lot for those who really wanna uh, follow what they are saying. So this is not a procedure where you have to stay in the hospital for a week. So, um, and then that's what we are prepping the patients for the clearing process, uh, getting them ready with several different specialties, multidisciplinary approach. Um, and, uh, and I'm glad that we are able to help those individuals who are choosing the program. Absolutely, absolutely. So as you correctly say, the reason patients are able to go home so swiftly after surgery is because of that extensive preparation beforehand. So that extensive preparation that we put in at the beginning is really to get the patients ready medically, mentally, and in every other way so that their surgery goes smoothly, their recovery goes smoothly, and they are well prepared even mentally to recover very, very quickly. As you mentioned, the vast majority of patients do very well in this setting. Of course, there are patients uh, that would not be appropriate candidates for outpatient surgery, and they have to be done in the hospital. There is no question about that, but the vast majority of patients will be able to be done in an outpatient setting. And then, as you said, there is no exposure to other illnesses that may be circulating in the hospital. And as you said, there is, uh, this important uh, component uh, of uh, comfort will, or that will patients uh, will experience when they uh, go and have a procedure in a center that specializes in that procedure where, you know, from the person who greets them at the door of the surgery center to the nurse that uh, helps them uh, get discharged, all they do is bariatric surgery day in and day out. So that level of care, obviously, when it can happen, and in our setting, obviously, it is happening, it will be desired. Who would be against that? There is, a, there is no question about that, right? Uh, but obviously, there are patients uh, who may not qualify for that because they may require higher level of care if they have severe heart disease, severe kidney disease, severe lung disease. In that case, a hospital setting would be appropriate. And obviously, our surgeons are able to work in hospitals. Uh, as you know, uh, Korea surgeons have been instrumental in actually building up the bariatric programs in our area, whether it's uh, St. Francis Hospital, Christiana Hospital, Bay Health, many of the surgeons working in this place were actually trainees under the Korea surgeons who really have started bariatric surgery in our area about 20 years ago.